happiness comes from the inside out. When we're living congruently with our values, there's happiness because there is that sense of wholeness. This wholeness is when the way of your being matches the truth of your being. In this episode, I want to start with a few concepts usually kept in the holistic or even woo-woo definition of things. I want to talk about these. I hope to at least normalize these concepts enough to move the woo-woo to simply woo, or better yet, wow, because they're pretty amazing. At the Wholeness Network Live in August of 2019, I spoke about a happening in the U.S., in the last half of the 19th century, the germ theory. What I discussed was a story about the death of President Garfield. He was shot and died several months later. And even in that period of time, but in the bigger period of time, since 1840, we'd had something that was debated across the ocean and inside medicine, the germ theory. And people thought it was hogwash. You know, there was a quote, I will not be afraid of something I can't see. It's it's hogwash. At the time, the doctors were, they had their instruments and the dirtier and grimier your instruments were, showed your experience. If you had a brand new clean scalpel, I don't even know if they have those at that time, but if you had a brand new clean instrument, it showed you were just a newbie starting out. <laughs> it's hard to believe. And this was, you know, by the time Garfield came along, you know, decades had gone by and there were some people starting, you know, there was definitely two sides to this, uh, this argument and the hand washing side of the argument belonged in the holistic world. It was for woo woo doctors and anything that was considered medically relevant thought it was nonsense. When the president died and they opened him up, there was newspaper clippings or newspaper articles that said he died of a bunch of infection. And it was almost like that moment of this was something we didn't know. It took a high profile person to really dive into really asking some hard questions But over the months, his doctors working with him, um, they did not wash their hands. And they still have his, like, like a piece of his backbone somewhere in some museum. And when I was doing my research, the injury would have caused maybe two or three days in the hospital at this time in our lives. But they poked and prodded with their dirty fingers and their dirty instruments, and he died of really, I think it was sepsis, really, but it was just a bunch of germs. And I talked about it saying, I think we're in the same place today with this emotional, mental, and spiritual component mixed with our physical selves. This communication that we talked about in the last um, episode, the energy system, that communication happening, we don't see it, we don't really understand it fully, and yet it's making an impact. And that was the point of my story and of my talk. I'm hoping that one way to move to a place where we use this information, whatever the energy healing that, or the understanding of the um, energetic system is useful, I think is education. And we need to understand some vocabulary because it's new for so many people. It's foreign and in fact, did you know the word germ was not defined in relation to disease and health until the 1920s? Until then, germ was a vocabulary word associated with seeds or germination, right? So germination of plants and things like that. It wasn't this living organism that causes disease. Not until the 1920s did it even become a vocabulary word. So rewind a hundred years, maybe a little more than that. And some of these words that I'm going to talk about today are meaningless to many of you, but I want to change that. So the first concept to define is our energy system. And in the last episode, I quoted a peer-reviewed paper 
from George Washington University Medical Center published in the National Library of Medicine that states, quote, this system, the subtle energy system, is defined in terms of cellular and systems communication. It's that communication between the cellular and the systems, the circulatory system, those things. What is that communication? And, you know, you got to really pause for a moment to think about communication. Is it a vocabulary word? Is it chemical? Is it even physical? How does this happen? How does that communication happen? It's something to really ponder for a long time. It's fascinating. It's why I love to study these things because we, it's just something we take for granted. You know, what is that communication that says, okay, now it's time to grow this bone, or now it's time to hit puberty, or now it's time to hit menopause, or now it's time to recover from this illness? You know, like, where is this intelligence? What is that intelligence even? Where is it coming from? The subtle energy system has various names in different cultures. Prana is the Hindu tradition. Qi is the Chinese philosophy version of the subtle energy system. And Qi is Japanese. They might say your Qi is off. You know, to this day in the United States, we do not say, hey, your subtle energy system is off. That's still woo-woo. But in these other traditions, it's not. And they've been around a little longer than we have. So it's maybe something that we can take some time and learn about. Um, maybe it might be called life force. Or for some, they maybe they would use that spirit. You know, your spirit seems down. Um, and and we just use these vocabulary, word, vocabulary words, but what do they really mean? This thing is what differentiates inert material or objects and life. It's that thing in between, like I say, that intelligence, that part of you that is alive. Subtle energy transmits information as frequency, which is defined as either the number of traveling waves in a given period of time or the rate at which particles are vibrating. This idea gets under some people. Think of sound waves or light waves. Easy. They are actual particles moving through the air and we interact with them. It's the same deeper concept that we don't stop and think about, but are getting messages subtly all the time. When we hear something, there has been movement, there has been something happening that if we had the right equipment, we could see it. We could see that there was some communication happening and it interacts with us and it affects us. Have you ever walked into a room and known something, thing, you know, something was off or that things were being said about you? We've all kind of done that, right? We don't necessarily take time to put words into what we are feeling. We just feel it. It is intuitive or even spiritual, meaning non-physical. It's not something we can just say, hey, I saw that in the air. I interacted with those vibrations, right? But that's actually what's happening. That's literally what is happening. In the same way information travels through a computer network or electricity network, energy flows through our bodies and even outside our bodies for purposes of expression, transmitting information, and communication. Emotions are also information, and sometimes we may choose to hold this information inside. When this information is held onto without being expressed or released, this can affect our subtle energy system in ways that leave us with more to deal with later on. Like it just stops a problem now, not letting the emotion out, but something's going to happen later, much like the ACE score and those drops of water. Our subtle energy body's quality is affected by external circumstances, our thoughts, emotions, and vice versa. Our subtle energy gets affected and our subtle energy affects our body. Our body is affected. It can affect our inner, our, our uh, subtle energy system. It's like I said before, it might have been in the last episode, that we're, we're looking at this kind of this no man's land in the middle of disease and cure and realizing there's a lot going on in between those two. And that's what we're wanting to study. That's what we're wanting to study. But it's been so nice because the medical world has made huge 
strides and accomplishments in saying, hey, we just are able to bypass that. We give you this pill and we can get you into this place. And it's been great for the things that it's been great for. But if you've been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, you must know that that diagnosis is almost a we don't know. Although we do know. But it's just not fully embraced yet that those ACE studies or those emotional issues are causing those problems. And it's a tragedy because we learn to just manage those ailments instead of trying to reverse them or prevent them from happening better, better yet to prevent them. And so I kind of just want to explain to you, and I've talked about this before, but explain to you how these disruptions can work. A few years ago, my gorgeous niece was getting married and I was helping with setting up the beautiful reception and it was beautiful and I loved it. And she left at the end of the night, went to go on her honeymoon and my sisters and me uh, worked to clean up, you know, the decorations and everything that were there for her wedding. So we got done pretty late. It was one or two in the morning and I was driving home, probably about a 40 minute drive. So I'm on the freeway. I'm, I'm all alone. You know, it's, it's dead. Like there's nobody there. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I swear, I look in my rearview mirror and there are headlights so close to my car, I, I couldn't even see them. The, the car was so close, the headlights were hidden, you know, and it startled me. Luckily, my reflex was to step on the gas instead of slam on my brakes. You know, I, I wasn't, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I wasn't thinking straight. So I stepped on the gas. Somehow that angered this car and they pulled out to the side of me, pulled up beside me, and then I slowed down, and it was a scary, it was just a scary moment, trying to, like, I didn't understand what he's trying to do, this car, and I just kept trying to speed up and slow down to not let him be by me, or to hurt me, or to crash into me, I had no idea, and frankly, I don't know how much time went by, it might have been two seconds, but it felt like an eternity, and eventually, um, which like I say, could have been seconds, but he just took off on the exit. We were clear on the left side of the, of the freeway and he crossed, I think, five lanes and exited quickly and I drove home. Of course, my heart was beating and it was scary. It was scary. And I went home and I woke my husband up and told him what happened. And man, it was just kind of startling, right? Well, time went on a year later, actually, and I pulled up my Instagram and there was my niece. Happy anniversary, one year, happy anniversary. And my body went, it just felt panic. It felt, I, I knew enough about this. You know, I was, I was a practitioner myself. I knew I, I had trauma inside of me because it had just gotten a hit and I started trembling and I started to get very clumsy and just became like I'm not being able to focus and so I knew you know I needed help but imagine so just imagine that the jolt to use an electronic term like I talked about the system that jolt that my system took when I went through that experience, you know, when, when that, when I first looked into the rearview mirror, mirror, even I had a jolt, it scared me. And then when I made an effort to remedy it and they didn't let go, it was a secondary joke or jolt because I knew this was serious. It wasn't just in my imagination. This person wanted to hurt me in some way, somehow. And so it was this big jolt and it disrupted my ease right? Like I didn't go home. I didn't sleep well that night. It was a major disruption. And a year later, that disruption was still communicating dis-ease or uneasy feeling. And I didn't know that until something, a reminder popped up that that was communicating within my system. So with the help of an energy healer, I was able to work with that communication and calm those messages but imagine if I didn't, this is what I ask myself, imagine if I didn't, the next year 
or whenever a car came close to me or whenever or whatever hit that emotional memory, then at my best, maybe I would move in and busy myself or numb myself or find a way to make that stop temporarily, you know, it's like, oh, there's those drips, drips, drips. Okay, figure out something else. So the, you know, to stop myself from feeling those drips, of, you know, that are uh, creating that Grand Canyon. But at the worst, those feelings maybe take over because at some point those distractions don't stop that communication from happening and maybe even it starts to multiply so then I start to feel anxiety every day or more often and now drip 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 I'm carving away at that Grand Canyon at a much faster rate and if I multiply this one experience by several hundred of these kinds of events because they happen you almost get in an accident. Even those small things that maybe aren't related to the ACE score, but these everyday small things, as well as those things that the ACE suggests, once those happen over and over again, I'm more likely to have my physical health impacted. I just see no other way. So there is this correlation, and I know you can even see it as well. Ancient cultures embraced and engaged subtle energy for guidance, fertility, healing, manifestation, and more. And I want to talk about this because there's much more than just physical healing when we work with the subtle energy system. Visuals of the body were created that mapped out energy pathways and collection centers. The most famous and well-known maps are called the meridian pathways, which is derived from traditional Chinese medicine and the chakra system from the Hindu tradition in India. And both of these date back to at least 3000 BCE. So we're thousands of years ago that this was found. And again, that kind of goes into what we want to move into. There wasn't the scientific method wasn't invented at that point. So they learned about these things by going in and and learning from that intuitive space, uh, I think, and connecting with things beyond that that taught them. This subtle energy system has three components, really. The meridians, the chakras, and the aura. And I want to talk about each of these. We did another podcast, a whole podcast on, on crystals. So instead of redoing that, I'll just reference that here and not repeat it. But if you want to know, that's another vocabulary word that people don't understand. Um, or that, and, and you know, I didn't either. I didn't understand. And then when you have an experience with a crystal, then you can't deny, you cannot deny it. And you, and you understand. I always tell people if the word crystal is uncomfortable for you, like it was for me when I started out, then call it a mineral. Because we all know that minerals, vitamins and minerals are vital to our vitality. So think of it that way. It's a mineral. That's what it really is. And it has properties. That's it. That's all you need to wor- worry about. And then I, the YouTube video I did on saging and smudging and kind of what that's about. Uh, another thing that I had a big bias against until I educated myself. And then it was less weird. And then it was like, oh, this and the symbolism behind it. The symbolism behind smoke and how they used it because it was a physical manifestation of of a request moving to the heavens that's that's the symbolism of it and once you learn symbols they're always beautiful when working with meridians chakras and auras intention is the key so don't worry about memorizing all of these things i have not but when you feel out of balance then you can look at these areas feel into what needs support, something will just kind of, that makes sense, or that works. And when you bring yourself and your agency to the process, there is a giving and receiving energy that fuels the wholeness you desire. If you look at it like this thing has control over me, and I I don't, you know, and it's, it's, it's control over me versus working with it, 
it's totally a different experience. Always bring your own intention to working with these areas. That way, it's the most supportive. So to begin with, we're going to talk about meridians. Meridians are pathways in which energy travel within our tissues that runs on each side of the body. There are 12 major meridians and one side mirrors the other. Each meridian is usually correlated to an internal organ and energy and blood are constantly flowing through the meridians. The meridians communicate information to your organs, such as the need for temperature regulation, emotional regulation, and more. Um, It's communication again, there's that word. When your meridians and organs are in harmony, your body is more likely to be in a healthy condition. When you are experiencing stress, the meridians become congested or blocked. This can have an effect on the mind-body-spirit connection. So that's the kind of the overview of meridians, these energetic, they're almost like highways, they're almost like your veins for energy, right? Each meridian has a specific function and when you look into them there's times of days, even the time of day associated with these meridians and elements that that they represent, but I'm not going to go into those here, I don't have enough information about those, I don't know the meridian off the top of my head, I can't just sit and name these, I'm going to look, i studied and written these down (laughs) so I don't know enough to teach them in any depth so I won't try but to briefly let's talk about those 12 meridians the first one is the lung meridian its function is to regulate respiration and intake of energy and I just you know like I say I I work with the energy system but I am not familiar with all the vocabulary and that has to do with meridians So when I took the time to study about it, how much sense did it make that the lung or the breath, the inspiration and expression is number one about our experience? I just think that's a beautiful thing to, you know, I'm always looking for the metaphor or symbolism. And that's life. When the breathing stops, life stops. So symptoms of imbalance for this meridian are viral and bacterial infections, excessive perspiration, inflammation issues in the upper parts of the body, problems with the with our nose smell organs, you know, and adverse skin conditions. What this would look like to me before I finish going is just to stop here. If I went to the doctor and I found I had a bacterial infection, then I might look at this meridian and I might google how do I support this meridian and learn more about it and then what it wants me to do I might do and it might want an element or like a certain time of day to wake up or to flow I don't know I don't know I would google it but but it's a matter of that's how it works it's like it's not and with an attitude of like openness and working with it instead of like I got to do this. I got to get better. You know, it's, it's more of a flow. And when we're working with energy, we want that energetic connection, that flow in and out, that ease, you know, when they, when you talk about being in the flow, it's like, there's not efforting. It's not an effort. It's just happening. And we want to kind of get into that space more than, I got to carry this around. You know, I've got to, I've got to have this essential or I've got to have this crystal or I'm not going to make it. I'm not saying that's going to hurt you, but do you feel how the flow of energy between that I've got to, I can't, or I better, or I must, or I cannot, how that kind of is not a flowing state, it kind of dead ends it, right? To be with flow in all of these things that I'm going to talk about. The second meridian is the large intestine, and the function is that it extracts and processes water from waste material before express, expelling it. So symptoms of imbalance might be abdominal pains and on an emotional level, difficulty holding or letting go. So again, if it's like, if you know, I, I might be like, oh, my stomach hurts. What what could that be? You know, in that, in that space between uh, ailment and cure, what's the message in between? And if I look up meridians, like, first of all, I'd be like, should I look at meridians? Should I look at chakras? Should I look at my aura? 
and just feel which one sounds most appealing. Feel into it and then study it and and then support it and see if it helps. Maybe support more than one thing. And the third meridian is the stomach. Its function is digests and extracts energy from food and distributes that energy to the spleen and intestines. And symbol, symptoms of imbalance are feeling of being worried or nervous and the lack of acceptance. So, you know, if you have a lot of worry or you're nervous, maybe um, look at the food that you're eating. Make sure you are you can support it by seeing if you're eating nutrients, you know, seeing if you're getting the right nutrients, I should say. Fourth one is your spleen and its function distributes nutrients throughout the body and maintains muscle and limb tone and regulates blood flow. And if it's out of balance or uh, it's in imbal- it's not in balance then you will have diarrhea maybe constipation bloating lack of appetite you might feel weak your muscles will feel weak you might have a lot of fatigue you might feel a lot of brain fog and really be absent minded or again confused or clumsy the fifth one is your heart. The function is it circulates blood to all the organs in the body. And symptoms are chest pains, palpitations, short, shortness of breath, dizziness, hot flashes, cold sweats, insomnia. A healthy heart meridian allows for joy and bliss in one's life, while an imbalance can lead to psychological problems like anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorder. Again, we're just in that middle ground. What can we do to help get, you know, to support that middle ground from disease to cure, something in the middle there. What, what, how can we support that? The small intestines distributes nutrients throughout the body. If it's imbalanced, you might have poor circulation, your weight, legs might feel weak, you might feel cold all the time, you might have a sore throat or swollen glands, I should say, um, stiff shoulders, a lot of acne, nerve pain, poor digestion, and, st- and stomach um, problems. The seventh one is the bladder. It removes liquids from the body, and it might cause a lot of stiffness in the neck and shoulders, headaches, back pain, all the urinary diseases. Emotionally, an imbalance of bladder energy causes feelings of anger and an inability to express emotions. So we can use this, you know, it's like if I'm feeling a lot of anger... Like say, hey, is everything going okay in that other parts of my body? Is that what's causing this? Or is that anger? And maybe that anger is just, you know, calling for some justice. But it's when you have these tools, you learn so much more about yourself. That's what the best part of this is. Eighth is the kidneys. It stores sexual energy, regulates the reproductive system, and produces flows and bone marrow. This is the meridian, not the organ of the kidneys. This is the meridian attached to the kidneys. And if it's imbalanced, then there might be genital or urinary disorders, backaches, asthma, uh, tinnitus. On an emotional level, the kidney meridian controls willpower, determination, and the ability to cope with hardship. The ninth is the pericardium. Pericardium? I don't know if I'm saying that right. It's the area surrounding the heart and protects, lubricates, and removes excess energy from the heart. This is important because it disperses energy throughout the body, preventing the heart from becoming over-energized. And imbalance may be disorders of the heart and chest and stomach, as well as difficulty expressing emotions, depression, um, phobias, you know, things like that. The tenth meridian is named the triple warmer. And it's called this because it controls the body as a whole. And rather being responsible for a particular organ system, it controls metabolism and regulates heat, moisture, and body temperature. So it's kind of an all-over all over meridian. And it's in it, when it's imbalanced, it has a wide range of disorders. It's responsible for the whole body. Any issue with the organ in the body has some way is associated with the imbalance in the triple warmer meridian. If you Google like energy medicine, I think Barbara Eden has like a triple warmer. It's like a almost an exercise or a technique to really, and that's something people do every day to just support that because it's an overall, it's kind of one of those, it's like a 
a blend of essential oils that kind of covers a whole bunch of things. The 11th one is the gallbladder, and it stores and expels bile produced by the liver. The symptoms of imbalance are bloating, liver pains, you're, maybe you're yellow, you know, you get that yellow pigmentation on your tongue, skin, or in your urine. And the last one is the liver. It circulates energy, regulates menstruation, and the female reproductive system, and maintains flexibility of tendons and ligaments. When it's out of balance, balance you might have menstrual disorders, dry skin and eyes, jaundice, blurred vision, vertigo, stiff joints, head, headaches, and on an emotional level, you might have a lot of anger or irritability, depression, or lack of emotional flexibility. Again, we're, it's kind of like a stepping stone. Either you can support the liver or support the, maybe the liver's the problem or maybe the emotion's the problem and look to the liver to see if it's getting affected. You know, it's like, it it's, it's can go both ways or all, all the ways. Now, moving on to chakras. So chakras are spinning, spinning energy centers that receive and express subtle energy and emotions. In the Hindu system, there are seven main chakras. The chakras are anchored in the core of the body and lie along a straight central energy line. Information that is carried by energy is transformed into body sensations, communicating an emotion or how we are feeling about our environment. So again, there's that communication thing. So that energy is transformed into sensations and they tell us how we're feeling about in the moment. So you walk into a room, your stomach falls out beneath you. Does that mean you're excited? Maybe. Most of the time that means something's not right. But you will feel a sensation and, and it'll be in your stomach area, which is, and that is associated with your power, either your power or your relationships. What if something's taken an emotional hit? The traditional seven chakra system begins at the root of the spine and ends at the top of the head. Each of these spinning energy centers are associated with different body parts as well as certain metaphysical aspects. Various experiences throughout our day-to-day -day life can affect our chakras. Trauma, grief, uh, things in our personal lives, rejections, rejection, love, or fear, or any other emotions can have an effect on our chakras. So again, our chakras can affect our feelings. Our feelings can affect our chakras. So when these chakras are blocked, they can spin slower or they can sometimes completely stop spinning and flowing easily. Whenever I talk about chakras, I talk about how, how instinctual they are. You know, when we're talking about love, we talk about the heart and I instinctually put my hand on my heart. That is chakra 101. Like you've just engaged with the heart chakra which is all about love connection. But where did that come from? It's the, the organ of the heart. Where did that come from? This is really part of our language and our thinking without even knowing it, these chakra systems, or when someone's mean to you, it feel like you got punched in the gut. We say that got punched in the gut because you feel yucky in that area of your power or your relationships. It's a physical manifestation. Um, and again, go get the free energy class at thewholenessnetwork.com down and uh, at the footer. And then you can get this free class that's much better to watch and see. And then there, and there's so many things in the library about supporting these different things. So I hope you will join the library. And there you've got the tools just there for you. You don't have to Google anything. Use the, the library. But the root chakra, we'll go over this quickly because many people already know the root chakra, the color's red, it's at the base of the spine, it's associated with grounding, the sense of security, our feelings of safety and survival. Imbalances can be expressed as sciatic pain or hip problems, legs, knees, feet, lower back, maybe immune disorders or eating disorders. So is the disorder telling you a message about a problem? you know, that's, that's in, an emotional problem, or did that emotional problem cause this eating disorder? You know, we, we move into that space and discover and figure it out and reprogram whatever communications, wherever that, whichever way that communication is pointing. The sacral chakra, the color is orange. It's in our lower ab abdomen, just below the navel. It's associated with relationships, sexuality, creativity, and power. An imbalance may be expressed 
like lower back pain, lower abdomen disorders of the sexual organs, urinary problems, menstrual issues, sexual repression, shame or guilt. The solar plexus, the color is yellow, it's upper stomach and above the navel but below the sternum and it's associated with confidence, self-esteem, courage, trust, that gut feeling, you know, when you when you just know I've got a gut feeling this is going to work, you feel powerful. Another way to say that would be I feel empowered about this. So that's your power chakra. Your vitality is really associated with that. Um, if you're imbalanced, you can have anxiety, maybe acid reflux. You can have fatigue or exhaustion. That pit in the stomach, you know, is calling for some support. Gallbladder issues, adrenal issues, maybe some control issues, feeling like you're out of control or need to be in control. Maybe abuse is happening somewhere on some level and um, irritable bowels. The heart chakra is green or pink. It's in the heart, lungs. It's also in the hands and arms. And it's associated with giving and receiving love, compassion, and forgiveness. And when we have that heartbreak, it may manifest as asthma, pneumonia, or there may be unresolved grief, resentment, guilt, congestive heart failure, heart attacks, inability to empathize or sympathize, and we've got an imbalance in the chakra. And we want to do all the other stuff too. Take your medicine, but add this to it. Add support for the heart chakra. The throat chakra is blue, and it's in your throat, thyroid, and mouth. It's associated with self-expression, choice, communication, and creativity. When it's in balance, you might have sore throat or TMJ, that joint in the jaw and teeth. Um, you may have judgment toward others or yourself and being very critical. There might be addiction, thyroid issues, or swollen glands. Again, when we don't have a voice, then who we are doesn't isn't being seen and heard. And so it's very much our who we are, our expression. Almost the symbolism of that as well as the physicalness of that expression is in that throat chakra. The third eye, the color is indigo, and it's the space between the eyebrows a little under half an inch above your eyebrows maybe and it's associated with your brain your penile gland your eyes or your ears it's associated with intuition wisdom open-mindedness right it's like hey if you're open-minded then you can see a lot broader you know more than just what your eyes see that's kind of the idea you're able to differentiate between truth and fiction and you may have psychic abilities stay with me don't get lost on psychic abilities. Notice any communication happening when you hear the term psychic abilities. This is the time to get curious. Feel what that feels like. For some, nothing. For some people, it's like, yeah, I get their psychic abilities. And for others, it's going to just, they're just going to want to pretend like they didn't hear that. There's a lot of, you know, resistance there. But this is one of those things where, yeah, just notice that sensation. Where does that show up? That either no big deal or big deal. Just notice that. So an imbalance can look like learning disabilities, seizures, brain tumors, strokes, headaches, migraines, sleep regulation, dizziness, paranoia, depression. Crown chakra, the last one is the color is violet. It's sometimes white and it's at the top of the head, maybe even above the head. And it's associated with spirituality, higher love, inner guidance, a sense of connectedness with others. And manifestations of weakness can be nervous system imbalances, depression, um, disconnection or alienation from uh, loved ones or, or people, lack of empathy or chronic exhaustion, or sensitivity to light or sound is sometimes um, can, we can support that with work on the crown chakra. And lastly, I hope you're still with me, the aura is, it's like an image of yourself that is projected outside of you. An aura is a multi-layered light that surrounds all beings. When our chakras are blocked, our aura, or aura, 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 may appear dim and less vibrant and sometimes even black. 
an aura presents itself as more than one color, but typically there is one predominant color. And there are people that can see these auras. But sometimes we have to look at the word see as a broad term for an intuitive feeling. Even though this can come naturally for some people to be able to see this aura, you can train your eye to see auras. So you can start by putting your hand against a white paper or something really white. And sometimes you can just start to see the slight color outlining your hand. You might think you're making it up. Is somehow it is you're like, I, I, I don't know if that's a trick of my eye. But when you practice, then you will see it. And the aura is connected to the seven energy centers of the body or the chakras. And it's comprised of several layers. And this is something that I'm going to begin to study a little bit more. And I'll, I'll explain more. And I'm quoting here from the seven layers of your aura on foreverconscious.com. But the first layer is the etheric, and it's closest to the physical body. It represents the physical body, mushroom, the muscles, tissues, bones, etc. And it's connected to the root chakra. And they say it's a bluish kind of gray color, maybe. And it's the easiest to see with the naked eye. And it's stronger in athletes and those that are active than it is in people that are sedentary or people that have an, their immunity is compromised. The second layer is emotional, and this represents emotions and feelings. To me, it's like, wow, that's like the emotional body. It's connected to the sacral chakra and can be all the colors of the rainbow. And just isn't that a beautiful because beautiful metaphor because we need all the colors to be creative, and that's our creative chakra. And it can be muddied or discolored at times when we're under emotional stress and the state of chakras can be easily determined from this layer because it's it's got all the colors in it it's all important it's our emotional self so if, you know if we can look at this and see this a layer and deal with in this layer of the aura we can kind of get a sense of what the other layers are doing the third is the mental and it's represents cognitive processes and state of mind it's the mental body it's bright yellow in color and it's connected to the solar plexus it often radiates the strongest around the head neck and shoulders and it's stronger in those that engage in mental tasks or who have a really active mind the fourth layer is the astral and it represents where we form our astral cords with others so let me interpret that. That's right out off of the website. But let me interpret astral chords with others. <laughs> There's a, another big deal about a vocabulary word, but I would um, interpret that as these connections we choose to take with us, maybe in the long term, maybe even into the next world. You know, these these important relationships. The color is pink or rosy in color. It's connected to the heart chakra. It becomes stronger through loving and intimate relationships. It can be weaker when we have breakups or conflicts. And the state of the chakras are easily visible from this layer as well. So it, it's a good um, place to, to look at. Then we have the etheric template. This is the fifth layer, and it represents the out, entire blueprint of the body that exists on this physical plane. It includes everything you create on this physical level, including your identity personality and overall energy it's connected to the throat chakra it can vary in color and it is healed or made stronger by expressing your truth and knowing who you truly are the sixth layer layer is the connected to the third eye it carries a very strong powerful vibration again if we're going to if i'm going to interpret that that means if we set it to music it would be a very strong and powerful music so that's another word for vibration. You know, it's just going to be powerful and strong. It represents the connection to the divine and all other beings. It's where unconditional love and a feeling of oneness flow. It's white in color. And when strong, the person may have the ability to communicate with the spirit world and maybe even receive angelic messages. Feel inside for how you feel about that. And it can be healed or transformed through unconditional love. Then the seventh and final layer, or well, we'll get into that, is the catharic template. And I don't even know if I'm saying that right. Um, they say this could be this the furthest out from the body. It represents if the feeling of being one with the universe, holds all the information about your soul and previous lifetimes, 
vibrates at the highest frequency connected to the crown chakra. It's gold in color. And when strong, it gives you the ability to surrender to the path of the divine and can help increase the psychic abilities again. It is believed that there are more layers to the aura and they will be revealed as we advance our level of consciousness further. And as I was preparing this con- uh, podcast, I got the chills as I read that last sentence. I hadn't seen it the first time I skimmed the article. And I don't know much about the aura, to be honest, but I was on a bike ride the other day, uh, last night actually, and I was pondering on some issues I was having and the thought came to me out of kind of nowhere in that pondering meditative state to pay attention to my aura layers, which I've never done that before. And I felt like just, you know, and getting curious, I wonder what would that be? You know, I, I didn't even know there were layers, honestly. And I felt that there was the third layer was significant and the fourth and the seventh layer, they were needing support. So I'm on my bike. I have like a phone mount and I Google it. You know, I didn't even know. I don't, I knew nothing. I know there's an aura. I, I, I know there's colors, but I, I just something I haven't, um, learned about yet. And because of this experience, I will begin to learn. So I looked at the information that I just shared and I was surprised that there was a third and this, there was a seventh layer and that those were the impact that these were the parts of the impact I was feeling. Those were the things I was kind of struggling with that feeling of, uh, my, my thoughts were just all getting to me and those thoughts were helping stopping me from surrendering to my path I uh, those are the things that stuck out for me I didn't even know again I didn't even know how many layers were you know in the aura and that's even why I googled layers of the aura to find the information because I didn't even know on that and then luckily as I was doing this and wanting to talk about it I was like great got the information right here just to stop, I just want to reiterate, like when I just stopped and asked, went in and and communicated inside myself, I came up with this third and seventh layer of of the aura that I didn't even know exist and, and how and that gave me clues. Like I said, oh, that's right. Those are the areas. That's what's going on. Because sometimes we don't know what's happening inside of us. As I was writing and meditating on the layers and kind of like in that moment of awe that that these this message you know, had come to me and it turned out to be just what I needed before I had looked it up. Um, I thought about that seventh layer and, and how it was that, you know, it's the furthest out from the body. And so it's kind of that first line of defense and how those things seem to be taking a hit. Those feelings of being one at one with the universe, feeling that, that at one and maybe information about what is my purpose, who I am, where my problems lie, uh, my connection to the crown chakra, which is that spirituality, and surrendering to the divine and and things like that. Those are kind of some things that are taking some hits. They're kind of falling away in some aspects in our society. You know, I just thought, well, that makes kind of sense because that seventh layer is that outer layer getting hit, you know, and and I could see uh, inside my mind this broken and bruised image, you know, like, uh, you know, I didn't know what it looked like, but I could just see like, yeah, I could see how that's what's interacting with the world. That's the outer layer. And, and I could see how it might be bruised and broken. So because I had the time and I was in this meditative state with like beautiful music playing in my AirBud, AirPods, I got curious about you know, how could that be remedied or, you know, that's really rough that that part of us is getting attacked, you know, or, or just, you know, having to take a hit. And in a moment of time, almost a bunch of information downloaded. It was so fast and I will try and explain it, but the information came in less time than I'm even saying this sentence right here. Like it was in a moment, it was just moments of time. I saw in that way of seeing, uh, or imagined this eighth layer. And I wonder, I thought, what would that eighth layer be? 
and it is the womb or symbolic of the womb and that eight is a feminine uh, the, the, the number eight is feminine and eight is also similar to that infinity sign of flow back and forth of to me condition unconditional love you know just constantly flowing in and out and uh, and then I started to think in this moment of time that is now much longer to talk about than it was to experience, you know, how I thought about how the voice and place of the female has been missing or lessened. And so this layer has been too, but that it's here and that the womb is a safe place and it is the ultimate place of nurturing and protection. And as we elevate and empower women, this womb layer will protect and nurture us. I wish words could do justice to the moment and the enlightenment that I felt at this time. I, you know, with this information, then I started thinking, do, wow, what, what can I do? What can I prepare or create or go into to kind of facilitate this eighth layer um, igniting into people or even into myself and so we'll see where that goes but I just wanted to tell that story for you to understand this place of communication of experience that we have within our it's it's within our physical bodies but it's communication that happens emotionally mentally and spiritually and these kinds of moments they had to really hit me over the head before I understood about energy work and before I learned about energy healing. Um, I guess most people would never have had these moments. They would say, I've never had those moments. But they are there if you move toward them and become part of that communication between systems and cells of the energy, energy system. There, in this space that we don't even have words for yet, there we learn. And I know it may be foreign we learn there. I hope you join me for every episode in this series and share them with your friends and family. I've said it before. Again, as you listen to these modalities, pay attention. And maybe you may even have to go back and listen to this one again and see, pay attention to your feelings, sensations in your body as you learn about different things, things that may be new to you. Notice the resistance inside of you Notice it and then get curious about whether that resistance is a message of warning and incompatibility or if previous thoughts and beliefs are preventing you from being open to something new. It's just something you're not used to. There's a big difference between a warning and, or, and maybe just not for you and something you're not used to. A, something that is foreign will feel uncomfortable at first. Or, like I said before, notice the feeling of 100% yes, I'm in. I got to find somebody that's that practitioner. I'm calling, calling her up right now. Sign me up. Pay attention to that message. Is that message really about wanting something fast and easy? Which may be more of a message about how much you are suffering. And maybe we need to stop there for a minute and give a voice and see that suffering. Because we sometimes, in order to just wanting to feel better, we are in this resistance place. Just anything just to make it go away. And of course we want it to go away. But first we need to realize and we need to see it, that it's there. And that it's causing a problem. And maybe get a little more information on it. We might need to acknowledge it first. So deciphering between the difference in energy you feel as sensations in your body, this no way, or this I'm all on a board. The difference will only be able to be felt within you. Nobody can tell you what's right for you or what's something that's something you'll pass on. But when you go and listen internally, you'll get messages and understanding for yourself. We invite you to the wholenessnetwork.com where you'll find the Wholeness Library. Inside, you'll find tutorials, downloads, mini classes, and all sorts of streaming content for you on your wholeness journey.